usual, we choose a subject that crowds us a little. And uh, to attempt anything that is a complete survey of the field, and the time that we have is a bit of audacity, but we will do the best we can. And this evening we want to establish the foundations upon which we hope to build in the series that will develop from tonight. In the first place, our subject is anthropology. And we know that the word is derived basically from the Greek anthropos, meaning man. Now in this case, our subject is a little different from psychology. The name psychology is also derived from the Greek, but in an adaptation that certainly was not in the Greek thinking. Anthropology, however, may be said to develop from, to be based upon, the concepts and hypotheses established by Greek thinkers between 300 and 600 B.C. In all essential principles, we are moving upon the Greek understanding of the nature of man. We have expanded that knowledge tremendously. We have at our disposal instruments of verification unknown to the Greeks. Uh, their research, their contemplation, was essentially a combination of rational and intuitive elements. Uh, they recognized, as we must sometimes also recognize, that reason in itself is an acceptable instrument of science. That nearly all discoveries, that nearly all advancements, have resulted from a foundation set in reason. And these, in turn, expanded and justified by scientific techniques. Thus, we do not need to be afraid of reason. What we need to fear is that we shall wander from the reasonable, and in that way endanger our position. In this particular series, we have added to the term anthropology a defining term, esoteric. And I would also like to clear this, as we intend to use the term. The Greeks themselves had the concept that certain parts of knowledge are hidden. This hiddenness does not necessarily mean any deliberate effort to obscure, nor are we to merely take the assumption that certain individuals are private to certain knowledge which can only be attained uh, by cultivating those individuals in some way. The ancients certainly possessed arts and sciences which were locked within their temples and which they taught only to qualified students. Qualification in their eyes was not unlike a university entrance examination in our way of thinking. Esoteric, therefore, really conveys a certain neglected possibility in knowledge, something obscure, some part of knowledge that is darkened. This darkness may arise from common neglect, and through a long period of time, ideas which have apparently passed out of fashion without actually being disproven, may pass into a subjective condition, which we may talk, term esoteric, as not immediately and readily available. Things that must be sought for, dug out, or in one way or another uh, found in the ruins or rubbish of our common believing. Wherever the word esoteric is applied to a term of scientific importance, it almost means the equivalent of idealistic. In other words, it takes into consideration 
certain aspects of knowledge, not generally popular, not generally known. And it also points out uh, the need for further exploration of certain archaic or hidden fields. The possibility, therefore, of a larger knowledge about things, a knowledge in which things obvious are extended toward those ends which are not obvious, or where knowledge readily available is traced back uh, to foundations hidden deep in the mysteries of time. Thus we do not mean to imply supernatural. We do not mean to imply by the term esoteric cultal or pertaining to some private group of opinions. Rather, what we wish to do, if possible, is to restore a larger picture that is generally understood by the principal word, anthropology, to see if we can discover valuable clues in neglected areas, and most of all, to bring idealism into harmony, if possible, with modern scientific research. Esoteric religions are not those essentially apart from other religions, but are usually phases or divisions within a religion. Uh, uh, divisions of persons more deeply concerned with value. And I think that again is part of the meaning of our term esoteric. From the uh, general definition of this subject then, we must pass to a broader definition of anthropology itself. What is this field? Anthropology is a science and is concerned primarily with the origin, development, and social condition of mankind. And that part of anthropology which deals with origin involves many other departments of learning, such as, for instance, uh, for instance, archaeology. That which deals with the development of man also calls upon many forms of knowledge. These forms of knowledge having to do with the various biological processes in nature, particularly the, as these apply to man. And finally, the cultural phase of anthropology includes practically everything that contributes to the progress of man. And especially, I think, in its broader sense, the cultural part is deeply indebted to religion. Even the most conservative anthropologist will admit that there has been no single force operate, operating more continuously upon the life of man than his religious convictions. Thus, all these subjects have to be brought, brought together made into a workable, useful, practical combination in, for, in order that we may understand ourselves and in the understanding of the general orientation perhaps come to some valid practical uses. When these are discovered, we drift away a little bit from anthropology and finally discover that it leads us inevitably into the full problem of sociology. All of these elements we have to consider together, although we cannot extend any of them uh, to an extreme point without endangering the area of coverage which we hope to attain. Another perhaps simple way of summing up the problem of man uh, is to say that anthropology traces the internal instincts of man, from love of food to love of God. Everything that lies between comes more or less in the story of this unfolding human being. To go back then, we must now pause for a moment in the field of archaeology and even make a brief uh, detour into geology. At this point, let us also call something to our attention that we probably instinctively know but do not always remember at exactly the right moment. <coughs> Geology has become a very advanced and specialized subject. And in the course of its development, many brilliant minds 
have attempted to recreate the primordial world. They have given names to the various periods that have been noted, at least by geological fragments or by speculations upon the formations of various uh, strata and so forth of the world. Uh, these names, however, though we have come to use them quite familiarly, are really not names of anything. Uh, we speak, for instance, of the Pliocene Age. This is not the name for anything. It is a convenient man-made term. And we have to be very careful that we do not mistake words for ideas and become hopelessly bogged down in being contented to memorize uh, the various scales of time and circumstances uh, with which these abstract subjects are burdened, I would feel. Actually, the world, as Galileo said, moves. Everything is in motion continuously. Rome is not a series of sudden steps. Evolution is not climbing from one shelf to another and then pausing for a while. Evolution is motion. Evolution in the case of man is motion against another motion, the motion of nature. Everything moves. Heaven, earth, and man all move. Consequently, it is difficult for us uh, to comprehend all of the circumstances of this motion. And in trying to make it a little more tangible to our thinking, we even go so far as to attempt to assign dates to motion. Uh, these date assignments, as most of us realize, are very tricky and not of long endurance in most cases. Uh, various ancient dates are being continuously changed. Every new degree of development, every new discovery that we make, uh, every new instrument for calculating these problems, each will result in due time in a modification or change in the dating of the world. To attempt a basic date would probably be approaching the ridiculous. We do not know. <coughs> and all learned speculation in this matter is not knowledge. It is a hoped for conclusion. It is someone who has achieved sufficient dignity of reputation to put himself out on the end of a limb and hope that he will die before anyone cuts the limb off. He is only affirming to be ultimately refuted. But it's quite possible that this reputation will not injure his reputation because he will be gone by that time. Thus it is not within our speculation to attempt to date some of these vast cycles. Anyone who is interested in such dating uh, can consult available texts and will find the information in reasonably condensed form. One point, however, we will note, namely that for the last hundred years there has been a consistent tendency to push dates back. Whereas 50 years ago we dealt in the terms of 100,000, 500,000, a million years relating to the origins of certain universal uh, mysteries. We now prefer to think in the terms of a thousand million or five thousand million. And by degrees we get so thin in our thinking on these vast numbers that they are comparatively meaningless to us. We can no longer really conceive their actual meaning and we doubt if those who use them really can feel or experience anything except a tremendous sense of interval. Beyond that, it is almost impossible to rationalize. The tendency to push back geological data has also been echoed or reflected in the pushing back of anthropological origins. Therefore, uh, we know that we no longer live 
in the world which believed that man was created 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. We can no longer quite accept this. We must begin to recognize that if this statement had a valid meaning, we have missed the meaning completely and have applied it to something for which it was not intended. We have also lost much interest in the 50,000 year old man and the 100,000 year old man. So we now begin to think somewhat in this way from the standpoint of anthropology that the process is suitable for the generation of man for his gradual emergence in nature and for the process is bringing him up to his present state of uncertain nobility should be estimated in terms of not less than one and a half billion years. Now that's a long time. H.G. Wells pointed out that it was such a long time that what we call the historic era of man is less than an instant in that time. Now a billion and a half years is, as we say, purely a symbolic dating. Hardly will we get it spoken before someone will change it. But they will not change it for less. They will change it for more. They will say one day, two billion. Then someone will be more certain that it is three billion. One thing we may be reasonably certain, the date will not be shortened. Because the more we experiment into these problems, the more we realize that we have been hasty in assuming too much within the compass of our normal historical thinking. The next point that we should bear in mind is that this process of producing man had to pass through a series of modifications. These modifications we will later examine on several levels, but first I would like to dispose of the prevailing anthropological hypotheses. You are entitled to them and uh, your thinking should consider them, not eliminate them. We gain nothing in this world by saying, oh, that's not possible, and passing on to something else. Anything that is discarded must be discarded with reason. And anything that is accepted must be accepted with reason and intuition. Otherwise, we shall fail in our essential purpose. T uh, taking the terms generally familiar, we use them also to point out a certain conflict which almost immediately appears and render some of these terms rather obviously arbitrary. It is assumed that down through this period of one and a half billion years, it took a great length of time to bring man to what might be termed uh, the condition of biological maturity as a species. Now various guesses have been made as to how long ago this important maturity occurred. The guesses at the present time are running from 500,000 years to about 100,000 years. This does not mean that man prior to that time was not here. It merely means that man prior to that time had a certain psychobiological childhood that up to a certain period man had not attained to the faculty or power which modern anthropologists feel contributed the most to his progress and that was the instinct to culture. The instinct to culture had to arise from something. It had to arise from the attainment of certain previous conditions. And the instinct to culture is regarded as a unique attribute of the genus Homo. This instinct to culture is not to be observed in other kingdoms of nature that we can see. And I might also point out that this has caused a bit of concern in some quarters because it rather de definitely assails 
certain phases of the Darwinian hypothesis. If man is simply the product of nature, a nature which also includes other creatures indubitably older than himself, or which have attained to what might be termed their biological maturity, not ours, but theirs. It rather amazes a certain group of anthropologists why the instinct of culture has appeared only in man if man is part of a common creation. In other words, if all creatures are molded from the same essential uh, universal essences, substances, principles, how is it that this one element is unique in man? What lies behind this uniqueness? Why is he unique? By what cause or circumstance was this factor or faculty bestowed upon him and withheld from others? And as man has been growing and developing, surrounded by other life in various forms and degrees, for a billion and a half years or more, how is it that rudimentary traces of this cultural instinct are not appearing in other parallel kingdoms in some way? Why is man so unique? We may point out an exception in the ant or the bee. We may feel that certain cultural instincts do appear in these creatures, but study of them still leaves us in a state of general bewilderment. For we would scarcely have expected uh, a systematic development of culture in this comparatively limited bracket of evolving life. So the cultural instinct arising in man seems to be derived from some independent source. Otherwise, what we like to think today as common experience would have produced it in other creatures. They were in the same environment. If environment causes all, why did it not rub off on them? If environment is the total cause for our uh, cultural individualization. How is it that other creatures in the same environment did not develop also at least cultural systems suitable to their own kind? This we find not to be the case, nor can we fully explain even now why this differentiation of creatures, some of which unfold in one way and some in another and still others seem to disappear entirely in the limbo of time. Thus our anthropological background is essentially and obviously weak. There are so many more qu uh, questions than there are answers that our only available technique uh, to use in the ordinary sense of the word is to follow the idea that we cannot know why but must always interpret why as how. The why we simply do not know. How we are beginning to suspect we can uh, make a few statements about without being entirely ridiculous. The recent findings in connection with this subject also present us with another definite problem. Let us assume for a moment that our anthropologists are somewhere near correct in their assumption that man moved from a survival foundation to a cultural foundation not less than a hundred thousand years ago and probably considerably earlier. If this is the case, why are we so peculiarly and mysteriously devoid of the connecting links which bind what we might term the growth of culture to the flowering of culture. When we study a child, uh, we may have 
some record, either in memory or by the old family photograph album, and we can say this was Willie when he was five, and this was Willie when he was six, and this is the way Willie looked when he had his first uh, uh, summer camp, and this is the way Willie looked when he went to college. We have all of this information. But in the case of man, we do not have this information. We say this is the way Willie looked when he was born. This is the way Willie looked when he was grown up. We have nothing between. When I say we have nothing between, I mean by this nothing that the grown-up Willie begins perhaps five to six thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era in terms of anthropology. Grown-up Willie rises to our attention with Egypt, uh, with the ancient Indic foundations of culture in the trans uh, with the rise of the earliest cultures of China. We perceive a tremendous flowering. We see the builders of the pyramid. We know from the study of their works that they were not merely infants with prodigious strength, that they possess knowledge, integrated knowledge, scientific knowledge. This in itself is a very, a very strange and somewhat wonderful circumstance because it represents the attainment of a certain cultural platform. We are perfectly willing, or perhaps a little grudgingly willing, to acknowledge there were some pretty smart people five or six thousand years ago. It is humiliating, but we will ultimately get around to it. That is not so bad. But what about the people ten thousand years ago? We have nothing to link them with the rise of Egypt. We have speculation, yes, but that is all. We do not know the steps that led up to the dawn of historic culture as we know it. We know they must have been there. We know that there has to have been a cause for the effect of power. We know that man did not suddenly step through a curtain from nowhere, but we do have what is called the dark curtain of history. And this dark curtain covers the backstage of a situation that is most intriguing, but about which we are almost totally without knowledge. Thus, we must assume one of several things. First, that in some strange and mysterious way, what we might term culture was quickened at a certain time. And out of an abysmal lack of itself, or debility of itself, there came a sudden and incredible flowering. The next possibility is that there was an unbroken line of historical ascent and cultural ascent behind Egypt, and that for some reason we have not been able to rediscover the remains or evidences thereof. It is intriguing, however, that we should be also uh, so frustrated in many other areas. We might assume that the possibility of the tides and times uh, which have removed so many monuments, sweeping away some, but how do we explain the sweeping away of all? Why is it if we cannot find anything in Egypt, we are no better off in China? Why is it that we cannot move any of these civilizations and cultures back beyond a certain point? If we go behind that point far enough, we pick up culture again. We pick up culture 25,000 years ago. 50,000 years ago. We find evidences of ancient culture in crude drawings on the walls of caves in Spain and France. We find carved bits of bone and broken artifacts that tell us something of the people who lived very long ago. But in between, there is this strange, incredible, inscrutable darkness. And up to now, we have not been able to penetrate it. So we pass over it with a few generalities. Generalities which also are likely to be subject to constant change and modification 
as time goes on. Also on the general field of our subject, we realize that in the clouded wall of what we might term this black curtain of history, this mist that hangs over the origin of everything, the same mist that hangs over the inner life of man, dividing the visible from the invisible, a mist of oblivion rather than of darkness, a mist of, a mist of unknowns and uncertainties, a strange wall of emptiness which is more firm and more solid than any wall that we know in this world. A wall which we strive desperately to break through, only to break ourselves in the attempt. Sometime man will break through, but up to the present time he has not been able to do so. So we now have a parallel phenomena accompanying this, and that is that right against this curtain, this dark curtain, as though against a motion picture screen, an, an incredible fantasy unfolds. For well, just at the point where history vanishes into the darkness of prehistory stands a tremendous pageantry of shadows which we call myths. Myths and legends. Someone has said that mythology is the history of the prehistoric world. But this rise of a world of legends, legends that are distributed throughout the world, legends dealing with the sources of things and also in an intermediate way with other things legends that certainly originated long ago but passed gradually into embodiment in the earliest institutions of history as we know history legends of ancient times that perhaps move into embodiment in the heroes and the, and the great uh, persons who must have flourished at a comparatively remote time. Yet never do we find these heroes, these remote persons, either primitive or barbaric essentially, or different from the cultures uh, which later developed around them. Had these heroes been different? the cultures would have been different because these heroes became the archetypes or the patterns for the development of culture groups. Thus we find, for instance, standing against the background of Greek mystery, standing between the known and the unknown, the rising of great hero cycles, of which a good example is the cyclic myth of Hercules. Now Hercules was not a primitive being, he was not a neo-anthropoid, he was not a creature uh, corresponding with the concept of the Cro-Magnon, he was not that kind of person at all. Hercules was a son of the gods, he was a great person, he was endowed not only with vast physical strength but also with great skill, with wisdom, knowledge of arts and sciences and he stood out to the Greek world as a truly heroic prototype of the satisfactory Grecian of at least one period in Greek thinking. Who was Hercules? Was Hercules a deified mortal? Was he someone who lived long, long ago, perhaps in that shadowy land between history and prehistory? Was he a complete fabrication arising in the mind of Greece? Was he a dream symbol brought out of the unconscious or subconscious life of the Grecian people? We do not know with certainty the answers to these questions, but we gravely suspect, as psychology also points out, that it is very difficult for an individual to dream a complete fabrication, that he may distort, that he may confuse, that he may bring patterns out of focus and out of harmony with each other. But psychology would be inclined to suspect that man cannot dream totally apart from his own experience. 
Therefore, if he could dream of Hercules long, long ago, there had to be something within himself which made the establishment of this archetypal concept possible. Yet at the time when very likely this dream was being uh, brought into expression, we are not in a position to assume that man possessed the environmental circumstances that would have made the Hercules dream possible. This presents another very confusing element of our pattern. So let us divide for the moment our world into the unfolding of history, which is nothing more or less than the story of the unfolding of culture. That behind this is this mysterious middle region between history and prehistory. And there stands the great cycle of the myths from Hesiod, the Vedas, the great teachings and mysteries of Assyria and Chaldea and Babylon, the wonderful legendary and lore of China, and even some of the prehistoric myths of our own Western Hemisphere. Then behind the myths we have what looks to be a very prosaic world, a world of very commonplace things, of flint axes, and of long, difficult struggles with saber-toothed tigers, and a man struggling for fire, struggling for the domestication of animals, and following one anthropological thinking, uh, working for perhaps several million years to find out that he could make a friend out of a dog. These kind of things were all there. We find him weaving and making rough pottery. We find him uh, gaining such extraordinary self-modesty as to begin to wrap animal skins around his body. Whether for protection, ornamentation, or morality, we do not know. We suspect that it began with protection, passed from there to ornamentation, and only became a problem of morality after he himself became corrupt. This is the way these things have a tendency to develop. So we have a kind of a strange stage on which we have to set our play. If we are not too questioning, we have no problems. The moment we begin to question, we have no answers, but such is life. <laughs> Out of this, we will proceed to the next situation that we are concerned with. Actually, science is not at all certain as to how man came into being. So actually, uh, they depend today very heavily upon the Greek thinking. Now we have a belief or general feeling that the Greeks were the greatest mythologists of all time, that there was no group of people that could spin more elaborate fantasies than our Grecian forebears. And they point out the such delightful episodes as Zeus turning himself into a white bull and abducting Europa and things of that kind, and to follow the statement of one small boy studying it, they had the awfulest imaginations. <laughs> Actually, however, the Greeks were very sensible people. And that means that someday their mythology will have to be completely reestimated. They were not the kind of people who were foolishly following any doctrine or belief. Uh, Arthur Murray of the Department of Greek and Roman Antiquities, the British Museum, tells us that in the Greek we have the story of the creation of man and that perhaps of all peoples the Greeks were the only ones who said that the development of the species did not begin with a single pair of persons. This is one of their more or less unique contributions. The Greeks in their own simple natural way divided uh, this concept to assume that man appeared simultaneously in a number of areas. That man was not merely uh, one generation, but it was a kind of species. 
and even among the Greeks themselves, there are separate, or worse, separate, distinct creation myths for the different provinces of Greece. The Greeks did not feel that they descended entirely from one pair of human beings. They believed that at a very remote time, by various circumstances, man came into existence in many places. Therefore, they assumed that it was scientifically reasonable that uh, human beings were different even from the beginning. That these differences to the Greeks were not qualitative in the sense of one being having greater aptitudes, attributes, or more worthy of honor than another, but simply that they were different. And our early Greek thinkers in this matter were quite ingenious they assumed that these different beings arose in different regions and therefore were immediately exposed to the pressure of regional conditions. Thus long before they had attained even uh, anthropological adolescence, uh, those who dwelt or were originating in mountainous areas were different from those in valleys or by the shores of the sea, persons in tropical regions different from those in frigid regions, and the Greeks had already discovered that climate and location were tremendous forces in the individualization of man. Now they did not attempt to explain all the mysteries thereof, but they took it rather for granted that humanity was a kind of creature, that it appeared in various regions, that these regions became distinctly and definitely associated with the races, tribes, and clans that originated in those regions, and that growth was the natural unfoldment of men in the places where they were, and that the secondary factor of growth was the gradual awareness of other men, and the mingling and bringing together of these different groups under various types of sociological pressure. The Greeks got about that far, and that is as far as they were able to go, with that particular phase of the subject, although this does not exhaust their whole thinking on it by any means. It would not be easy to quickly uh, exhaust the thinking of Hesiod or the thinking of Plato on such problems as this. The Greeks in many regions had their legends and their myths. One of the most common of these, of course, is in share with nearly all others, namely that there were two distinct creations. That there was a creation preceding a kind of universal deluge. That there was then a creation following this deluge that there was somewhere in the ancient form and time of things a race or an order of life of human nature and structure at least capable of those moral delinquencies which we associate peculiarly with humanity and no other creature by which the wrath of deities uh, came to bring about a deluge or a destruction in punishment for sin, and that this ancient order of life vanished away. The second concept of the Greeks relating to this was the replenishment of man, not the origin but the re-origin re or the secondary appearance of man. And one of the most familiar and common legends relating to this among these people is the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Uh, this legend tells uh, that these two, the human survivors of the deluge, consulted an ancient oracle to find out how the earth should be replenished. And the uh, oracle told them to cast behind themselves the bones of their mother and for a long time they were not certain what was meant 
Then they realized, or are made to realize, that the mother was the earth. Therefore, that the bones of the mother could be rocks. So they each took rocks and cast them back over their shoulders. And these rocks that were cast by the man became men, and those that were cast by the woman became women, and thus the earth was replenished. The Nordic peoples believe that the original human family evolved from ash trees that were most anciently honored, and that a certain kind of tree gradually changed into human beings. Uh, the Phoenicians and other ancient peoples declare that life all began in water. Now this is uh, a very interesting point because this belief was held uh, by these people long before it had any significance whatever in modern thinking. In fact, the modern approach was at least theoretically a complete rediscovery of the hypothesis. We may suspect that someone turned the pages of an old book, but we're not in any position to know just who or when. But this ancient uh, mud or slime, which was the origin of life, was called elus. And uh, from it came the word elium, which was the ancient name for the city of Troy. This ancient slime, by means of a process of corruption, disintegration taking place within itself, release monocellular or simple organisms, and from these simple organisms there grew gradually by evolution all of the animal, um, fish, bird, insect, and reptile forms of life, and that these various forms of life gradually unfolding finally resulted in the appearance of man. Now for people thinking this through probably 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, that wasn't so bad. They were, what we would say, on the right track. Or if things should change in the course of time, uh, they and we are on the wrong track together. Uh, at least that is the way uh, we think about it at the present time. This brings us again uh, to uh, an effort to estimate uh, what you might term the problem of the origin of our kind. And uh, at this stage, going back to the very shadowy phase of things, we can only say one of two things. Either that we will stick with the modern anthropological findings, uh, which are in substance approximately what I have said, or else we must strive, strive through ancient institutions of learning and through tradition, through legend, and through ancient sacred sources to see if we can enrich this story and by so doing bestow upon it what we would like to term its esoteric overtones. On this basis, then, we go back to the oldest accounts that we have. Accounts that have any tangible cultural significance to us today. I can go out here into the valleys back in California or even not any further than the caves near Santa Barbara and find writings on the walls writings of strange and primitive symbols. I've had probably a hundred examples brought in here to have read. People want to know just exactly what those symbols mean. Uh, such symbolic reading cannot be achieved. The most that we can hope to do is to suggest certain psychological reasons why primitive people should make use of certain symbols. Those symbols were devised by them for meanings that lived and died with them. We cannot be again one of them. Consequently, we cannot actually experience what they meant by these symbols, which have no alphabet, which have no formal structure as we know it, are but a small group, and probably are among the earliest pictoglyphic ancestors of hieroglyphs. 
We cannot restore them, but we can realize that someone way back, or maybe not so far back in time, but far back on cultural platforms, devised these to preserve some record or make some mark that others might be able to share with him. That is, uh, That was the beginning of this type of thing. Back in the days, therefore, where we are most interested, we have no records, not even crude markings on the walls of caves. Much earlier, far behind this, no written language, no spoken language that we know, no true evidence or substance upon which to build. We are groping back into the twilight of the pre-dawn of mind as we know it and we cannot relive it. The only hope that we can uh, accomplish is the instinctive, intuitional restoration of it out of our own unconscious, where it is the only place where it can be locked that we can reach. Whether we can reach it immediately is a grave question, but it will never be found except in man, inasmuch as it is part of that infancy of man, which psychologically can sometime be restored out of the symptoms and symbols that arise in his more advanced state. This is all that we can hope to think through very clearly. Others tried to think this through before we came along. The Egyptians tried to think it through, and they were a little closer to it than we are, although the proximity is probably fractional. They gave us all together this wonderful age of fables. They gave us their psychological restoration from the folk or from the subconscious collective. Everything that was possible to conceive to be there. Therefore, we do have, as we find later in Jewish sacred literature, two distinct creations that always parallel. In the Jewish, it is the Yavistic and the Eloistic, and in other faiths, it takes similar or parallel structures. And all these cultural origins together, there emerges at the dawn or the beginning of things the gods. Nothing begins actually below. That is something that is in our subconscious. It is not something we've learned primarily. Even if we had learned it, it would be much like other learning that is long, long gone and forgotten, unless there had been something about it that made us want to remember. And so today, 6,000 years after the rise of Greek myths, we still study them in school, and we are grateful for the great Greek dramatists, like Aeschylus and Sophocles, who have given us <coughs> revisions of these ancient stories in the first great theatrical productions of Greek theater. All this then goes back to one primary concept, that it all began in a strange way with the gods. Now different nations have different gods or different names for gods, but further re research on the la basis of language proves that there is an underlying submerged lost language form which bears heavily upon the subject of our concern. That these various names did not actually arise from any language that we know, but from a mother tongue that must have existed back in there. And that this mother tongue itself evolving at a remote time broke up into languages which we know. And that the oldest languages we have today are also branches. That the mother tongue, like the mystery of life, is lost and can be found only in other languages, showing through, shining out, through great structural similarities 
of word idea patterns uh, which we are able to restore and use. So we have the rise of this order of gods. This order of gods tells us one thing, that at the time it was devised or developed, man possessed certain intuitive insight. Uh, we have another brief pause, a slight digression only, to point out that in all probabilities the great mythological systems of the gods did not arise like Athena, full-blown and full-armed from the head of Zeus. These myths also had their dawnland, their childhood, their infancy. But some 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era, these myths reached their psychological maturity, and nothing important has been added to them since. From that time on, they did not grow. They were only remembered. And others coming after them attempted to release from them meaning beyond the literal by the instrument of interpretation. And this instrument of interpretation has forever been a shifting and changing thing. The gods, then, were the origin of all the various things that man knows or experiences. They lived in a world, at first, unknown as to location. It's a funny thing. You have your evolutionary procedure working here also. Somewhere in the beginning of time, the gods uh, dwelt around the corner. The gods dwelt in the nearest mound. The gods dwelt in the grave of the ancestor. The gods were almost anything from a little piece of bone with a feather on it uh, to the most complicated concept. But from primitive people we realize even now that the gods of ancient man must have been very near to him. He couldn't quite see them, but he could almost reach out and touch them. Therefore he left a little food for them. They were hungry. He tried to be nice to them because they had a bit of vengeance in their natures, among other things. These gods were very near, very real, and might even, under mysterious circumstances and dreams and trances, or in any unknown happening, might appear to manifest in proper person. Gradually, the gods began to move away. They became more and more remote less and less physical, and at the same time as they drew further away, the area of their omniscience enlarged. Uh, the original god uh, nearby could only perhaps understand the doings of a family by listening at the keyhole, so to say. He had his little shrine in the house and people talked to him, and that's how he found out things. And even today among primitive people, it is not uncommon to have them punish deities or saints or other persons who do not appear to be taking proper care of the family. Down here in New Mexico at the present time, in, this, in the little downtown villages, you will frequently find an image of St. Joseph in a niche in the wall. He has been turned with his face to the wall as punishment for failing to perform his proper duties in the household. This is a very near, but it is also a very primitive belief. But little by little, the gods moved away. But as they moved away, they became greater beings. They became vastly more important. And in the case of, uh, of the Greeks, they moved to the mysterious, shadowy mountain peak of Olympus. Uh, 